Hey, if you uh, if you are joining us online for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. If you joined a watch party and you stumbled your way across this uh, stream, we're again we're we're thrilled. We really are. You are a special guest, um, and and especially uh, to those who um, are in the healthcare field or who are on the front lines of this. We want you to know, or maybe you know somebody that's in that position, we want you to know that we are for you, that we are praying for you, and we are, as a church collectively, and even in our connection groups, we are doing um, as much as we can to try to figure out how we can best come alongside you, support you, and serve you, because um, we so appreciate all that you're doing. Uh, And we also, before we get into this, we also want to acknowledge um, maybe the reality that you're feeling right now is that this is difficult. This is hard. This is not ideal. Um, and we know that perhaps uh, harder days are ahead. And uh, we want you to know, and, and we think you'll find it here, that there's all kinds of hope to be found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we beseech you, we beg you to to run to him during these times. Even though your kids may be... Um, uh, driving you crazy. Um, mine certainly aren't. Um, but maybe your kids are uh, just ha- having a difficult time. Maybe you're having a difficult time being so uh, isolated. We're grateful for technology, but um, let's just be honest. It's just not the same. And I can't wait for the day where we'll be able to gather again. Until that time, we are. We're grateful that we can do this where we can still open up God's word and and study it and and we ask you to do that we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3 verse 14 through the end of the chapter if you have a Bible with you um, we encourage you to pick that up even though you may be watching this you may be sitting on your couch with a cup of coffee in hand pick up your Bible yes it's going to be on the screen we'll take care of you if you don't have uh, a Bible but we encourage you to pick it up and and walk through this with us. And I think what you'll find is a rather simple message uh, today, but hopefully a message um, that so many of us so desperately need. So Revelation chapter three, we've been in a series entitled, Is He Worthy? We're asking the question today, is he worthy of everything? Is he worthy of your everything? Is he worthy of your entire life? That's the question that we're going to come around today. We're looking at a letter to the church of Laodicea, or La- ho- however you say that name, uh, the church of Laodicea. And we're, we're looking at um, a few things that we can pull out that help us understand and know who Jesus is. Because it's only as you know who Jesus is will you be able to understand who you are, and it is only by those two understandings, who Jesus is and his glory and his majesty and who you are, that any of us will be able to come before the throne of God in any confidence to know that um, he has us. And we want you to be able to come to the throne of God in that confidence. This church in Laodicea was an interesting interesting church, actually. They, uh, they were filled um, with a kind of um, a kind of pride or a kind of arrogance. You see, um, in about 60 AD, there was a there was a big earthquake that shook the land, and this community, Laodicea, and many of the surrounding communities were uh, ripped apart. Um, everything uh, was in shambles. Everything was in rubble. They had to completely rebuild after this earthquake. The Roman government, who occupied the territory at the time, offered to come in, much like our government has issued a stimulus bill. The Roman government came in and said, hey, we want to help, we want to give you money to rebuild. But the thing of it was is that these people, these Laodiceans decided that because they had considerable wealth and because they were, they were rather good business people, that they could rebuild and they wanted to rebuild without the help of the Roman government. They said to this government, no, we don't want your help. We can do it on our own. You see, there's a couple defining factors about this 
uh, this city that gave it its wealth. First of all, they had a booming textile industry, which which is to say that they made these elaborate black outer garments, these robes or coats, and they they were they were sought after in the modern world. Many people wanted these, and so they could charge a good price for them. They also had um, uh, an incredible healthcare system. There was a temple to the god Men, and uh, in this temple they would make ointments for the eyes and for the ears. And and they these ointments would help heal if you had an eye ailment or something going wrong wrong with your ear. These these ointments would help you to heal and to feel better. And so because of these two industries, these people were, these people had considerable wealth. They, they, they had lots of money. And with that came a whole lot of arrogance, a whole lot of pride. And the church in Laodicea was not immune to this. This arrogance and this pride seeped into their church and it's to this church and to this city that Jesus writes his last letter to the churches in Revelation. And so if you have a Bible, Revelation chapter 3 verse 14, here's what he here's what he says. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your words, your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I think the first thing we all need to know and understand about Jesus this morning is that he sees you. He alone sees you for who you really are. He introduces himself in verse 14 in three ways. He says that he is the amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of God's creation. Which is to say that Jesus is the only one. His words carry more weight than anything else and anyone else in the entirety of creation. Him and him alone. He gets the last word. He gets to define things and he gets to start things and he gets to end things. Jesus gets to speak louder. You know, uh, when I was, when I was uh, between seven and, and 10 years old, I, uh, I, remember, this, I remember this time, m- my family uh, had a routine that uh, every night my mom would uh, take us to bed and then my dad would come and say good night and kiss us good night and, and and that was our routine um but this particular day I I, I I did something wrong i don't remember exactly what i did wrong i probably lied or did some or fought with my brothers and 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 beat them up because i used to do that a lot and um and uh, i'm kidding come on i didn't hurt them that bad uh but i uh i remember that i did something bad and then it came to nighttime. I had to, I had to live with the consequence of that. And my mom came and tucked me in, gave me a kiss, told me good night. And then I was expecting my dad to come. I didn't know that he wasn't feeling very well. And so he, he didn't end up coming up right away. And, and in, those, in that couple minutes of, of wondering if my dad was going to come up, I, I, I became like overwhelmed with emotion. I started bawling my eyes out. And, and my brothers who were in the same room, that we, slept, we all slept in the same room at the time, uh, started yelling at my mom, hey, Josh is crying. And so my mom comes in and asks me what's wrong. And, and I tell her that uh, I don't think dad loves me anymore because he didn't come in and say goodnight to me. And of course that wasn't true. My dad did love me. But in that moment, what happened was I let my guilt and I let my shame speak louder than anything else. Then what I knew to be true is that my dad really did love me, but I let myself listen to the lies of shame and guilt. And I wonder if you've ever listened to the lies of your anxiety or your depression telling you that you can't and that there's no hope. 
I wonder if you've listened to the lies. If if you've let your intellect speak louder and define you more than Jesus himself. I wonder if maybe, maybe you've let your wealth define and speak louder than anything Jesus has to say. I wonder if your charisma and your and and your career advancement has defined you more and spoken louder than Jesus himself. It's easy to do this, you see. And what Jesus is saying here in verse 14 is no 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 no. I get to speak louder. And listen to what he says in verse 15. He says, "I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. We need to clarify something very important here. Remember, he's writing to a a church, a group of Christians, and Jesus is not, catch this, this is important. Jesus is not making a salvation statement. He's not saying, oh my gosh, guys, you Christians, I wish that some of you were cold. I wish that some of you would just reject me altogether and stop following me. And then I wish that others of you would jump all in and be as on fire as ever before. It, he's not trying to draw a line and, t- and say to the, this church, these Christians, his own bride, that he'd rather some of them reject him altogether. That's not what he's, that's not what he's saying. In the least bit. You see, um, in Laodicea, the way they got water was there was hot springs about five miles away. And how they got water from these hot springs was through an aqueduct. And the this hot water five miles away would travel down this aqueduct and end up in Laodicea. And by the time this hot water got down to Laodicea five miles away, you can imagine, it was lukewarm. And so what most people did, it was a big problem in the city, what most people did is they would honestly spit it out of their mouth. They didn't enjoy it. It wasn't useful. Hot water, as we know, is, is, is useful for cooking and preparing food. And cold water, as we know, can be refreshing to our body and help us sustain. But lukewarm water neither tastes good nor is very helpful. And Jesus says this incredible illustration to these people who would know exactly what he's talking about. And he says that they are lukewarm, which is to say that this church has lost its vibrancy. This church has lost its distinctiveness. This church all of a sudden has stopped becoming helpful to their city, stopped being different, and have blended in. They were meant to be a city on a hill, bright for the world to see, and now it's hard to recognize them from everybody else. To them, Jesus says, I will spit you out of my mouth. Why? Because you're not being bright like you're supposed to be. Why? Because you're not being helpful like you're supposed to be. Jesus and Jesus alone sees you and me for who we really are. And then it's interesting that he says in um, verse 17, for you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. You see, these people fooled themselves like so many of us do. They said, he, he, I think we're this way. I think we don't need anything. We're rich. We've got it all covered. We can take care of ourselves. Jesus said, no. In fact, you are wretched, poor, pitiable, blind, and naked. These are not charming qualities. These are not good qualities, but Jesus and Jesus alone can see who they really are and he can see who you really are. He can see the things you've done in secret. You can't hide anything from him. He knows you better than you know yourself. He does. And he alone sees who you really are. And the reality 
for this church and I believe the reality for us apart from Christ is that we are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. You may have all kinds of money. You may have a wonderful family. You may have you may have a lot of things together. But the reality for you and for me is we start here. We start we are wretched, poor, blind, pitiable, and naked. That's who we are because Jesus alone sees who we who we are. And then he goes on to verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. What is he saying here? This is the second thing you need to catch about Jesus is he, he alone has what you need. Jesus has what you need. And why does he say these specific things to these people? It's because they had all kinds of money. And Jesus says, no, 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 come to me, buy from me gold that has been refined by fire. Don't trust in your own wealth. Don't trust in your own capacity. No, come to me and buy from me. He says to these people who are known across the known world for creating these, these elaborate black garments that people wore across the world. And he says, no, come to me and buy white garments. Why, why white garments? Catch the beauty of this, because that's what Jesus does. Jesus takes what is black and makes it white. And then he says, no, come to me and, and buy from me salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Why salve to anoint your eyes? Because they were the purveyors of salve. They, were, they specialized in ointment for your eyes. And instead of depending on their own ability to create this ointment, Jesus says, come to me, because I alone have what you need. He alone has what you need. He does. And then he goes on in verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. The last thing that we need to come around this morning is very simple. Jesus, he, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Jesus, Jesus wants you. I want to clarify that statement because we're not saying that Jesus needs you. Because he doesn't. Doesn't. Jesus doesn't need you to be happy, to be complete, to be full. He, God, the triune, our triune God, is completely satisfied in Himself. He doesn't need you. And why would you want to worship a God who 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 needs you? You don't want to, that's no God at all. Why would you want to worship a needy God who needs you to complete? No, no, no. Jesus doesn't need you, but he wants you. No matter what you've done, no matter how many people you've hurt, no matter how long a rap sheet you have, no matter what you've done in your past, no matter what you're currently doing right now, now. No matter the mess that you've caused, no matter the heartache you've gone through, Jesus wants you. Listen to what he says in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. You know, I think in the days we're living in right now, I think rightfully so, a lot of people are asking, where is God? Where is God in all of this? There's so much pain and heartache going on from, from people dying from this disease to, to an entire economy 
an, an entire world economy being shaken to the core, people losing their jobs, chaos ensuing, where is God? I think he answers that right here in verse 20. He's standing at the door and knocking. And he wants you to let him in. No, we can be fooled. The enemy wants to try to fool us to think that God's God's way far away, that God's up there just kind of looking down on us, not involved in our situation. That is a lie. That's not true. I believe God is closer to you than you even realize. And he's calling you home. It is time for you to come home. To cross the line of faith. As he said in verse 19, to, to repent. To turn around and realize that God is right there. To realize that he hasn't forsaken you. He hasn't given up on you. He hasn't gotten rid of you. To realize that he is standing at your door and knocking and waiting for you to come in. And that's the invitation for you this morning. Whether you've been a Christian for any number of years or whether this is your moment, this is your time to cross the line of faith to begin a conversation with God that will last a lifetime and to move from darkness to light, from death to life. It is time, believe it's time for you to to come to terms with as you realize who Jesus is, the power and the grandeur that enthrone his being. And as you realize who you are, wretched, poor, pitiable, blind, and naked, much like many of us have been, and you realize that only he has what you need. It's time to repent. It's time to look on him as your Lord and Savior. Because here's what happens. If you do that, I want you to catch this. Verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit... Why sit and not stand? Sit because Jesus' work is finished and sit because you can have rest and peace for your soul. How many of us want rest and peace for our soul in these days? I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the That's the possible future for you. Eternity is in the balance right now. And we want to give you an opportunity to cross that line of faith. To believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you do, the scriptures are clear. You will sit with him on his throne. Let me pray for you. Hey God, I pray. Um, I pray pray for my friends listening. I pray for... Pray for those who have not yet moved from death to life. For those who haven't crossed the line of faith, who haven't realized how how gracious and merciful our God is to look on us, pitiable, poor, blind, naked, wretched us, and to desire us. To as we'll celebrate next week to die on a cross for us, to be risen on the third day, proving that all of the wrath that that should have been ours was emptied onto Jesus and that there is now no more. God, I pray that many, pray that the person listening whose heart's pounding in their chest right now would make the decision to cross the line of faith to trust in you as their Lord and Savior and for us who have forgotten who we are who have thought that we were 
better than we are. I pray that you would allow us to listen to these words of Jesus. Allow us to go to him with everything that we need. To trust him with everything. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you, uh, if you, if you chose to follow Jesus as your as your Lord and Savior. We want to celebrate with you. We want, to, we want to rejoice with you and we want to resource you more. You just began a conversation with God that will last a lifetime. And so we want you to, want you to let, us, let us know. We want you to let us celebrate with you. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can text just one word, alive, to the phone number on the screen. You can, if you're on our online platform through our website, you can go to the live prayer button and someone will be right there ready to pray with you and and resource you to be able to walk with Jesus further. If you're watching on Facebook, would you do us a favor? Would you direct message us on Facebook? Or maybe you can even direct message the person that you jumped on the watch party with and they'll get in touch with us and we would love to be able to come alongside you in your journey with God, we are so excited for you and all that God continues to do. Are you ready? Are are you you ready to sing? I'm ready to sing. Let's sing.